name's Robert Reed, and I was born in Nebraska, in Omaha, and I came here to Lincoln for school for, at Nebraska Wesleyan University uh, in the 70s. And I stayed, for the most part. There was a year, a little bit more than a year, I spent in Dallas, Texas. But basically, I've been here since. Several times I've gone to school at the university, uh, once to pass my time, another, uh, to improve my mind, another time to uh, get a teaching certification that never finished. Three hours of elective physics and, and one uh, uh, stint as a student teacher that were what I was missing. I didn't, I didn't do that because I got a contract for a novel. So I decided, well, that's decided. That's what I wanted to do anyway, so. Went to Wesleyan, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Biology. Um, and then I've, uh, like I said, I've, I've, I've dabbled in other things, but basically I'm, I'm done with education in, this, in that realm. I, uh, I started writing when I started going to college. And I sent off stories with the idea that it would be as easy as I found school to be, meaning, you know, I could, this wouldn't take long. How could this process take long? And 10 years later, I finally made a sale, you know, and, and, and expecting that to be the big breakthrough. Uh, nope, nope. You look at my bibliography, it, it starts accumulating over time when I got better at what I was doing. But basically since then, I have done jobs to support my habit as a writer. But basically I have tried to be a writer for my entire adult life. I will use anything in my life I can at any occasion. I will steal from my life and from people around me in any way I can't possibly can. There's an old Carson line, Johnny Carson saying you, you end up using everything and I feel like that. I, um, that said, for writing influences, I read a lot of science fiction in college which is unusual. Usually you start these, th these things earlier in life. But in my case, I, 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 I sort of decided to be a science fiction writer before I read science fiction in a major way, which has kind of mangled my career a bit because I went, went at it with a much older mind. I used to get rejection slips from a certain magazine where they would say the golden age of science fiction is 12, and if you can't write for a 12-year-old, we don't want you. I never sold to that editor. But I sell to that magazine regularly now. They've changed editors. So I, uh, um, for among the science fiction writers I've really enjoyed are probably Gene Wolfe, James Tiptree, Ursula Le Guin were my very big, my top writers when I was uh, in my 20s. And, uh, and I also, to my, possibly to my detriment, been influenced by William Faulkner in that I, this, this sense of a place, this, this he, he showed me that there were things you could do stylistically that uh, I don't dare try now. But basically, you know, it's still, there, there, there are moments when I find Faulkner still is, is a very, very good fantasy writer. Because much of what he writes is, is quite incredible and, and and uh, so he's, he's always been a major influence, too, even though I don't read him much anymore. A librarian friend of mine was, is now reading a story that recently came out and said he recognizes the library mm -hmm. and the YMWCA next door okay. and certain people, at least as uh, kind of a, uh, as categories at least. But I, like I said, I'll use anything. Uh, the weather, the, the landscape, yeah, I use. I use things. I, I did find out years ago, I made a discovery that really kind of astonishes me. Uh, when, you, when you send an editor a story about farming, involving farmers in, at any level, um, and you're from Nebraska, they believe you. <laughs> they just accept, well, he knows what he's talking about, even though I know very little about the business. I guess I knew in, in college, I figured, I mean, I, I very much enjoyed it, even when I wasn't doing it particularly well. And I enjoy it more now than I did then, which is a good thing, I think. Um, and I used to do it, oh, I used to do it exhaustively when I was learning to be a writer, when I was teaching myself to be a writer. I mean, I would, in the days before word processors or even, I, I had a manual typewriter and, and 
you make a mistake on a page, you've, I mean, a major mistake, you've got to pull it. And I had carbon paper for years. It was, I couldn't afford photocopies. It was, carbon paper was cheaper. And, and I would spend hours every day working. I don't do that anymore quite to the degree I did. But I'm more productive now, so it, it kind of has worked out. I like to be paid for my writing, which always is kind of inspirational. I, uh, though I don't demand much, I still like that idea of being paid, uh, receiving checks in the mail. I do, um, I like to play mental games, in the traditional what ifs of science fiction or speculative fiction, you know, what if. Um, for instance, my family and I are on a vacation last summer. We went to Estes. And I'm thinking, you know, this is a sort of environment where I could bet I could find a story, and so I'm looking around for a story. And one day, one of our days there, we, we went up a uh, tram up to the top over, over uh, Estes Park. And while we were riding up, this, this fellow who lives there joins us, uh, 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 kind of a 30-ish, older 30s sort of guy, angular, willowy. Um, he's a rock climber because he starts talking to some, some high school girl in the, in, the, in the tram with us about this, what he does and what he likes and so on and so forth. And I'm thinking, you know, he's just, there's something adolescent about the guy and I, I don't know, you know, kind of a perennial kid who, who moved to a place so he could climb rocks, mm -hmm. essentially is what he does. And so I was trying to figure out a story and, and it occurred to me some, some weeks later, I don't even remember when exactly, but it, it occurred to me that what would happen if, um, I asked myself, what if uh, in a place like Estes Park, they woke up one morning and found a new mountain? Mm -hmm. And this should be a fantasy story. I really don't see how to, how to, how to build it without involving super aliens. I don't see any way to build this, as a, this mountain any other way. But he's going to find a mountain and, and he's going to need to be, because he's kind of a local the local mountain climber, he's going to need to be the first one up this mysterious mountain. I have no idea what happens since. This is on my to-do list. It's on your to-do, it? hasn't quite. So I have actually bought a book, though, mm -hmm. to do research on, my, on climbing. Mm -hmm. I also thought it was an interesting topic, so I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm learning a, a little bit about equipment and techniques. And I've known rock climbers in the past, and they seem like very strange people. I have no, you know, they're kind of fearless, and they're very flexible. I don't know, two qualities I don't share. Uh, death um, of, of the universe, of individuals, of civilizations, um, as well as birth. Um, I like, I do well with large scale canvases, I've been told. In fact, that's where I make a big chunk of my money. My as close to a career as I have on good years comes from large scale, you know, far future space opera for the for the new century sort of writing. I um, I, I enjoy when I when I come to the, the library, and I do every week to read about science. I am always very interested in in. I mean, I'm I'm trained as a biologist, but my big interest is cosmology. Or astronomy, the sense that you know, there's this this vastness, inexplicable vastness, uh, that is uh, both beautiful, largely empty, and uh, temporary. Regardless of how you measure these things, it is impermanent. And and those as you know, from that comes questions that I could spend and have spent a life, half my life, doing, working with, playing with. I have my best time to work with our question is between 10 and 1, morning to early afternoon. And I, I mean, I could plot this out. Um, I can work at other times for various reasons lately. I have had times where I've worked bef after I, very early in the morning, 6.30 to 7.30, I, I have a window where I could do a page or two or something else. Um, but generally, it's 10 to 1 is responsible for most of my production. I have a, uh, a group I run uh, on a track at noon on Tuesdays, and that gets in the way of this. And I'm willing to sacrifice, you know, work around one day to do that, because it's the only time that group gets together. A lot of people seem to have these day jobs that make no real sense to me. And, yeah, and I just, I, uh, I guess I have to bend to their will if I want to run with them. 
I'm not a particularly good judge of what my voice is. I have been told that people recognize my voice when they don't know who I am. You know, I mean, if just reading it cold without a name. That said, from my standpoint, I feel I need a voice to tell a story, and the voice has to be different than any other voice I've ever done, pretty much. I mean, you know, there has to be something in there that's unique or special. When you go back and do a story that is a, re, you know, is a, is a, is a sequel to another story, you don't need a new voice, which is one reason those are in kind of intoxicating projects, because there's a whole big chunk of your work is already accomplished for you. I've done four uh, no novelettes uh, concerning a uh, near future time, I don't know how many years it would be in the future, not many, and a, uh, a clan of uh, uh, Lakota Indians living on the, in the sand hills in secret, and have been for generations. Um, and uh, it's their adventures in this rapidly changing modern world that we would find. It's, uh, I don't think people realize yet, after four stories even, how, how very much changed the world is mm -hmm. that, they're, that they're, they live in, from our own world. But they have been, they're in principle, have been living in secret for all these times. And that's a voice. I enjoy that voice. And having, having used it once, I've used it, I've enjoyed it enough to use it three more times. So, um, and there's an example, a perfect example of a place where I've decided to use Nebraska. I, l I like the sand hills very much. Sure. I, uh, I find them very scary, mm -hmm. uh, extremely bleak at times, and very empty. I couldn't write this story, though, for a long time because I didn't, I, I, needed, I needed another trick, and that is it occurred to me one day quite abruptly and without looking for this answer, it occurred to me that if, they were to, if there was a group of people like this that could live outside our century, uh, they would still, the locals would know they were there, the ranchers. Mm -hmm. And they would have to be living in cahoots with them. And once I, that was, uh, once I realized that, a lot of other story op options became apparent to me. I don't know my audience so well that I can say, yeah, I, I see faces. Mm -hmm. um, but I do have a sense of what I can get away with. And I do have kind of a, a construct in my head that tells me what I can and cannot do. I also kind of, I know editors, and I, I know certain editors, and I know certain mar markets, magazines. And I, I know what I, you know, when I'm writing a certain story, I'll think, this story goes to fantasy and science fiction. This one goes to Asimov's. This story doesn't go to either one, because I don't think it's that strong, and I'll send it somewhere else to maybe you know, what I would consider a secondary market. There aren't that many secondary markets anymore, though, so. As best I can tell you, it's, I mean, the old, the, the cliche is a sense of wonder. But I want moments, I would I like are moments for myself and for my reader where you, you think, wow, I want, I, I had no idea that would happen. Um, epiphanies, um, twists. I like stories that don't go the way you expect them to go. I particularly like it when my characters do things I didn't expect them to do when they take charge. Even you didn't expect that. Oh, I did not expect. Oh, and that happens far more often than I would ever admit. Because, I don't know, I mean, obviously I'm writing it. I don't believe in these hidden hands pushing me around. But I do think it's, it's a lot like a, a, a very, for me, writing is a lot like an extremely lucid dream. One reason I don't read as much as I used to is because my writing is my reading. I mean, I really don't know where stories are going oftentimes. And even if I have a very clear idea of where they go, I don't know how they're going to get there. I feel if you need encouragement, you probably shouldn't do it. I, the, the writers I've met that, that I mean, in my, in my business, there are a lot of people who are, have sold a story or two, and that seems to satisfy them, and we're all happy. I mean, they know that this is pretty much pretty much the top of their, this is all they're going to do. They have real jobs, they have lives that are very involved. They don't have time or the energy or the inclination. But if they really want, if they really want to, you really sh I mean, you're, they're addicts and you're not going to be able to stop them. I mean, I don't, I don't see this as a, um, uh, uh, I think this is kind of a litmus test for everyone who wants to be a writer. I mean, are you willing to do it regardless of who's telling you you're great or not? You know, and people will tell you you're awful. Even when you're very successful, people will tell you you suck. And that's just the way it is in this business.
Everyone has an opinion, and it's not, usually not the opinion you need. Every year, mm -hmm. let's start on the first or second day of the new year, I write out titles that I carried over from the last year of books and of stories that I want to work on. And every year, I think this list is getting shorter. But by the end of the year, I've usually built a bunch of new stories. And oftentimes, the new ones are the ones I write. But there's, there's titles I've had been holding for 10 or 12 years and still haven't gotten going on, still hasn't clicked. I mean, I have titles, though, that um, I had a title for a long time uh, called Camouflage. And I had a certain idea of what I wanted to do with the story as a general theme about the, uh, the vanishing of, of, of a person and, and uh, uh, a, a kind of a, a camouflage of identity, if you will. And I didn't know I knew how to do that story until Mike Resnick, a science fiction writer and sometimes editor, contacted me and asked if I wanted to write a, novella, a novella for a book he was doing for Science Fiction Book Club. And he would pay me X amount of money, which is, he pointed out, quite a bit more than anyone else pays for these things. And you know, it was amazing how quickly that, that, that title became a, a clear story idea. There's a story I'm doing for, uh, I've, I've actually now I'm getting to the point where I sell stories before I write them. This is what I've always done with novels. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's, it's with stories where an editor will. Uh, contact me and ask, would I have us in this subject matter, in this uh, time frame, and could I come up with something? And and, uh, and I've already signed a contract for another one. I've had a series of stories. It began as stories, and now are two novels too, which are the Marrow stories. It began with a, a novelette called The Remoras, then went to Eon's Child, and then a, a novella called Marrow, which did very well. And the and the novella caused my book editor to say it should, you know, why don't you expand it to be a book? And so I did, and that book did well. The novel Marrow did well. And so I have a sequel, The Well of Stars, plus a variety of other stories, some of which haven't come out yet. Camouflage is one. Where I wrote a, a the, the subject for Mike Resnick was, um, it had to be uh, kind of a private eye in space. And I, I wrote him back saying I had this idea for, I have a character in, in one story, in one of those Marrow stories, who's, um, uh, he finds lost memories. And I thought, you know, he has a way of amplifying your, your, your head, your brain in such a way that you can find out things that you'd forgotten, you thought you had forgotten. I thought he might make an interesting character for this, you know, private eye. He would have that sort of work occasionally, and, and he might. But Mike wrote me back and said, well, if he's a tough, you know, streetwise sort of guy. And I thought, well, he isn't really that way. I, but I had another character in mind. Well, that would be so-and-so. And that would, yeah, Pamir is his name. And I used him, and it, it worked out nicely. But these are, these are my ongoing stories. I mean, these are the, these are the ones I, I, this is my main series. This is what a good deal of my work more and more concerns is the Marrow stories. Well, good evening, and thanks for coming out on this interesting evening, weather-wise. My name is Meredith McGowan, and I am the curator of the Heritage Room. And I'd like to welcome you to the Heritage Room this evening and to the John H. James Reading Series, a series that's been in existence for 20 years, something we're very proud of. Um, we are here in the Jane Pope Geske Heritage Room, and it is a special collection that's dedicated to promoting and preserving works by Nebraska authors and about Nebraska authors as well. Um, we have about 12,000 volumes and they're done by some 3,000 authors. So um, we're also proud of the room too. We're glad to have you here this evening. Um, we do invite you to come back during the daytime when we're open for regular public service hours. This room is open from 12 to 3, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and on Sunday afternoons from 2 to 5. So we'd be glad to see you then um, to look around at, the, at what's here, um, look at the artwork, look at the other memorabilia that's here also. So um, we'd also like to thank the Nebraska Literary Heritage Association because we're able to bring programs like this to you because of an endowment that they um, established through their volunteer efforts. So again, we thank them. Tonight our reader is Robert Reed. Um, apparently Bob grew up in Omaha. I think he went to Benson High School. Um, I got that correct. 
Um, his college plans brought him to Lincoln where he uh, went to Nebraska Wesleyan University and he has a degree in biology. So science and science fiction, that probably all fits together. I know he's done some jobs since college days, but I think that he's obviously interested in writing and he's obviously interested in science fiction because he now has written some 140 works of short fiction and he's written 11 novels, I think. Um, and according to our reference expert here, Scott Clark, who's a fan of his and, a, and a, as I said, a reference worker downstairs, uh, this past year has been especially productive for Bob and it culminated with the publication of his latest book of short stories, The Cuckoo's Boys, that was put out in November. And according to Scott, we have Robert Reed hot off the press here in Asimov Science Fiction. This is the March one, right? They're both March issues. And this is science fiction, fantasy, <laughs> I can't read. Science, <laughs> there you go. And, his, and there he is right there, Robert Reed too. So um, just wanted to point those out to you. Um, we're really happy to have Robert Reed with us here this evening. Could you please help me welcome him? No, I have. Oh, you have. Okay. Oh, they, they send me. I get, not only do I get a check that usually uh, clears the bank, they'll send me two free copies of, of each magazine. So pff, it's fat. Well, for tonight, as much as I plan anything, I plan to read one whole story and then a portion of another story. And the reason I'm only reading a portion of the other story is because there isn't enough time. It's a very long story, but I enjoyed it. It came out recently, and so, um, and, uh, and I, my plan is it's kind of open-ended that way, and I can just read until I'm tired of reading, or all of you are asleep. So, that's my, the first story, though, it's a fairly brief story, uh, called The New Deity, and it, it, uh, it occurred to me, the story, the idea for the story came from uh, a sense of Looking, looking at a, a local news crisis and, and some stuff that happened in Nebraska and applying this to a different venue. So that's why I wrote this story. I had, a, I had an idea. It didn't take much time. I enjoyed dealing, playing with the idea. The New Deity. A news conference was called for early afternoon and then delayed twice for reasons never explained. In the interim, a wild hailstorm rolled in from the west. Peculiar fires sprang up in various kitchens and trash heaps, and every sleeping baby in the state woke from his nap screaming. Then, as evening fell, the overseer at last stepped up to the podium. He was a handsome fellow who wore a perpetual smile and a smooth, unruffled air. Since coming on board several months before, he had spoken glowingly about tradition, pride, and the demands of success. Like the man or not, he was undeniably smart, immune to criticism, and in ways that few others can even pretend to be, he was without fear. On that particular evening, the smile seemed especially radiant. While the eyes were the coldest blue, he gazed out at the assembled media, and with a voice that might be confused for warm, he said, Our state has, has been blessed, and for a very long time. Our deity has performed his role with distinction and honor. We simply cannot thank him enough. But by the same token, time marches, circumstances change, and our neighboring states and communities have been embracing new faiths and philosophies, many of them thriving as a consequence. This is why I have decided with the approval and full support of the board to relieve our good God of his duties, effective immediately. The search to find his replacement is already underway. Until that process is finished, his top lieutenant will serve as our acting agent of divine actions, and you may worship her or not. As always, your personal devotions are entirely your own concern. Of course, none of this was a complete surprise. There had been a few disappointing years of late, and after a private meeting between the overseer and the grand old man, a carefully crafted press release spoke a little too glowingly about the sanctity of the relationship, while leaks hinted that the climate between the two entities was far short of cordial. But when the, that, that final decision was announced, everyone heard thunderbolts. The fact that the old man wasn't present at the news conference spoke volumes. Cameras eventually captured him in the open, and the emboldened reporters bombarded him with pointed questions. How did it feel to be fired? Who did he blame? Would he attempt some kind of retribution? And if not, what were his plans 
for the near future. Answering only the final query, he said, I plan to rest, and perhaps for a very long time. This came from an entity that never took vacations, a tireless, imperious, and very remote example of godhood that always wore a handsome face and a busy, even consuming manner. Where, we, where will you do this resting, one reporter blurted. I really don't know, the grand old man confessed, and then, he and then with a few more long strides he started ascending into the heavens, on board the trim robin egg blue gulf stream that was awarded to him as a bonus after one of his final good years. Everyone knows the world is full of things that are real, though they have no true flesh. The deities, great and small, are exceptionally real. So are dreams and desires, too. And, these are, and, and there are those busy, relentless entities called rumors, bold little monsters too tiny to see, too slippery to hold. Within moments, it seemed as if everybody in the state knew exactly who would be the next deity. The trouble was that, that, the, the trouble was that more than a dozen names were being bantered about. Was the overseer sending out up trial balloons? Or maybe members of the board were voting for personal favorites? Certainly it had been years since the public had shown much interest in any single issue. Most observers couldn't remember days like this. And then, just when matters seemed complicated enough, the acting deity, the one-time loyal lieutenant, made a seemingly offhand remark to a newspaper columnist. I've always wanted to watch over a great state, she admitted, with a low rumble and a winsome smile. And yes, I do feel ready to take the plow in my good hands. I've told the overseer exactly that. I want to be considered for this great job. Suddenly it seemed as if the world was full of ambitious, hungry gods. Each day brought word of some fresh candidate, a city lord wishing to move up in responsibilities, another state's deity needing clean horizons, or sometimes a foreign god or exotic spirit who spoke in elliptical terms about bringing some unique brand of miracles and sub subtle inter intervention into a new realm. If just a tenth of those rumors were true, the overseer's office would have been jammed with holy bodies, but that was never the case. The selection process, like human faith and modern electronics, was a mystical and nearly invisible phenomena. The overseer would assume new names and fly to neutral locations, meeting secretly with a small, highly select group of candidates, but that didn't stop wagging tongues. Everyone seemed to know someone who had, who had that watchful cousin or old pal who most definitely had seen a famous god strolling through a local shopping mall, or perhaps sipping beer suds in a landmark tavern. They might appear human, but the knowing eye can always pierce the best disguise. One big name was observed on the state's most exclusive golf course, putting for a birdie, while a young ocean goddess was caught swimming laps in one of the, in one of the large irrigation reservoirs. Why the big name would bother with the likes of this modest state, nobody could say, and how a saltwater specialist could help the corn grow was never explained. But that wasn't the point. In the absence of information, information created itself. What is true about quantum mechanics is doubly true in the affairs of the human heart. There was also a second, decidedly less optimistic thread of rumor and innuendo. Ugly stories about the grand old man began to emerge, tales of disinterest and small incompetences, godly sins and human style ones. So many years of exemplary service had caused him to grow lazy, it was said. The worshipful, worshipful God, words and long, earnest prayers still fed him, as all, go, all gods need to be fed, but they also built a sturdy complacency. Wishes that were not answered as quickly as before. The quality of his miracles were, was definitely on the decline. He might have been playing fast and loose with certain state funds. And according to, the range, to range, a range of sources, the grand old man had cultivated affairs with at least two human women and possibly many, many more. Those rumors had more backbone than noise about, about candidates. Uh, those rumors had more backbone than the noise about candidates. And because the ugly stories helped people understand his dismissal, they were embraced, believed, and eventually made into history. Meanwhile, the interim deity watched over the state and its good people. During her tenure, the winter proved cold, but at least it provided abundant snow and slow, timely thaws. Then came some good spring rains, particularly in the western regions that had been suffering from long-term drought. She was just what the state needed, plainly. Columnists began to chant their support. Keep the gal god, one old newspaper man wrote, while the liberal, a liberal young woman writer claimed this is the millennium of the maternal. But about the actual candidates, the overseer said nothing, nothing at all. 
When news broke, it, be, it came from another part of the, of the continent. According to other media outlets, the ruling deity from a smaller, much poorer state was going to accept the job later that day. The evidence was slender but telling. A state plane had been dispatched, and at, and at that moment, it was waiting on the tarmac of the other state's capital, engines running, ready to whisk him back to his new home. But the plane remained on the ground, void of passengers, and afterward it turned about empty still and began the long, embarrassing flight home. Later, in an investigation that would consume the attentions of two at state attorneys general, it was determined that the god-in-waiting had never intended to leave his current post. Pretending to accept the offer was just a bargaining ploy, a scheme hatched by him and his agent to let them extract a richer contract from his own people. As a ruse, it worked wonderfully. But the overseer found himself looking silly and foolish. A sudden press conference was called, and nothing was accomplished except that he spent the most of an hour defending a process that nobody could see and asking for patience when there was no hint of a deadline in the future. But that ugliness must have supplied inspiration, because after that, events moved at a decidedly crisper pace. The acting deity finally had received an official interview, an event that she described to one reporter as being polite talk and idle BS. Other assistants tried their incorporable, incorporable the best to win the job and failed. And then, during the very last days, the most incredible and chilling rumor took hold. The overseer had looked at all the candidates that the world had to offer, and after much consideration, he had decided to claim the job for himself. For himself. Such things had happened in the past on occasion. Mortals could leave their realm if deemed worthy according to certain arcane laws and convoluted customs. Just as the gods could lose their immortality and livelihood if they proved themselves to be total boobs. A final press conference was called. The last rumor was taken as fact, and people of the state began readying themselves for this unexpected change. Yet the first godly form that strode out before the cameras was not the overseer, but instead one of the young gods from the, one of the world's new churches, a bold, baby-faced deity with ties to a hundred nations and fifty million people. Why would a great soul bother with the likes of us? That question bubbled out of everyone who was sitting at home, and from each of the spellbound reporters standing in that very crowded room. Why do I come here? Their new god roared back at them. I will tell you why. Then in crisp, concrete terms, he outlined a glorious future. He would continue to oversee the weather and the crops, the health of individuals and little communities too. But in this day and age, what mattered most were miracles wrapped around science and technology. The state's high literacy rates were going to waste, he warned. He spoke about a good university system that could be great. With a warm smile, he described laboratories where PhDs would bow before bow to him before uncovering new, new answers to old problems, or better, find new problems that no one, not even his, even his greatness, could have imagined. Then he reminded his audience, genius is as wondrous as the remission of a cancer, and as miracles go, it is twice as rare. Then he spoke about the need to attract high-tech industries to the high plains, and with his help, as well as lucrative tax breaks, and, and as the state economy moved away from simple agriculture, everyone would profit, him included, naturally. I see a future of great prosperity and purposeful change, he, he declared, causing golden images to appear in everyone's mind. And then, just as his sense of the new began to shake the old conventions, he added, but I will not leave behind those traditions and proven ways that matter to you most. With a wink, he said, the oldest ways remain the best. Then he threw a strong arm around the overseer, squeezing the handsome, fearless, and always smiling fellow with a rough familiarity. In the oldest times, he continued, the arrival of a new deity demanded a ceremony possessing both significance and sacrifice, and it should be the same today, I believe. All of you think that way, do you not? Suddenly, the overseer's perpetual smile began to crumble. The new deity glanced his way, blinking again and whispering a few words that no one else in the world could make out. The overseer straightened his back, trying to fight the gentle but irresistible shove of a god's right hand, and he tumbled face first amongst the reporters and cameramen, while a mighty god said to all, please me, and I might stay a little while. A soft squeal was heard. Thrill me, he declared, and I will make you glad. Then, a, then blood rose in a neat crimson fountain, and a cheer rose up over the good sweet land. It's a very strange thing to read your story like this. It's not, 
I mean, many years ago, I, tr I practiced, I was told that you should practice in your speeches in front of an audience, and this was when I was in, I think, high school. And so I got our dogs together, because uh, my family really didn't have an, any interest in this. And they actually were a fairly patient audience. I can't remember why. I don't know what it was. But it was very strange to sit there with a black lab and, and poodle looking at you, waiting for food, I guess. I don't know. But, but it's, it's just a very strange thing, I think, to read my stuff in front of people. So with that, move to the next story, which we will only get a piece of. And this is, a, I will tell you, this, is a, this would be a hard story to get. Um, it uh, was published, um, as a background, it was published in the Science Fiction Book Club like weeks ago. Uh, if you're a member of the book club, you can get this. If you're not a member, you might have to be more inventive because this is not published in a, in a wide scale. The Science Fiction Book Club is having troubles with sales. All book clubs are. And I think what they've decided to do is publish uh, unique stuff, stuff that's their own to draw in uh, new, new readers. Um, in this case, uh, Gardner Dozois is the editor. He contacted me, said that uh, he was paying X amount of dollars for a novella, and the subject was the extreme far future. I mean, that's essentially where you had to put this boy. And I, you know, liking the money he was offering, decided, yeah, that's a, I, I'm very inspired. <laughs> and and, uh, and then I, I actually took ideas that I'd worked on before in, in small scale and, and, and made it work out. Uh, a sidelight story on that, I, I did hear that The Simpsons will be a movie. And in the, in the creators and the people involved in the project said, you know, we always thought we'd do it after the show was over and run, but it keeps running. And then finally, Fox Movies just shipped us a whole bunch of money. And it was amazing, they said, how creative you can get at times like that. Well, this is, far, this is a far smaller scale, believe me. But this is where, in part where the story came from. It was the need to fill 20-some thousand words. Um, the story is, well, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Um, it takes place, it's, it, believe me, it's not the Earth. And it's not today. And these people, well, people aren't exactly people. And yet they are. And with that cryptic note, I'll, con I'll start. The story is entitled Good Mountain. And I'm not sure why. I don't know where I got the title on that case, but Good Mountain. Each chapter has its own title, which is unique for me. I don't usually do that sort of behavior. But this particular, the first chapter is called A Dot on Old Paper. World's Edge, approaching now, World's Edge. The worm's caretaker was an elderly fellow named Brace. Standing in the middle of the long intestinal tract, Track. He, he wore a dark gray uniform, patched but scrupulously clean, soft-soled boots and a breathing mask that rode on his hip. Strong hands held an angelwood bucket filled with a thick, sour-smelling white salve. His name was embossed above his shirt pocket, preceded by his rank, which was Master. Calling out with a deep voice, Master Brace explained to the several dozen passengers, from this station you may find your connecting trails to Hammer and Mr. Lowe and Green Island. If World's Edge happens to be your destination, good luck to you, and please collect your belongings before following the signs to the security checkpoints. And if you intend to stay with this splendid worm, that means left of left will be your next stop, and Port, Cross, Port of Kraus will be your, our last. The caretaker had a convincing smile and a calm, steady manner. In his presence, the innocent observer might believe that nothing was seriously wrong in the world. But if you plan to stay with me, Brace continued, you will still disembark at World's Edge, if only for the time being. My baby needs a rest and a good dinner, and she's got a few little sores that want cleaning. Then he winked at the passengers and began to walk again, toting his heavy bucket toward the stomach, up where the mock men were quartered. Or perhaps we'll linger here for two little whiles, the old man joked, but I don't expect significant delays, and you shouldn't let yourselves worry. Joe Pale sighed and sat back against the warm pink wall. He wasn't worried, not through any innate bravery, but because he had been scared for so long now, there was little room left for new concerns, or so it seemed at that particular moment. Indeed, since the, his last long sleep, Joe Pale had enjoyed a renewed sense of confidence. A guarded optimism was taking root. 
Calculating how far he had come, he saw that most of the world lay behind him now. While it wasn't too much to, of a lie to tell himself that Port of Cross was waiting just beyond the horizon. Joe Pale even managed his own convincing smile, and watching his fellow passengers, he found one other face that appeared equally optimistic. A young woman, built small and just a little short of pretty, was sitting directly across from him. She must have come on board during his last sleep. Maybe at which way, he reasoned. There was a fine university in, in that ancient city. Perhaps she was a student heading home, now that every school was officially closed. Her bags were few and small. A heavy book filled her tiny lap. Her breathing mask looked as if it had never been used, while a powerful torch rode on her other hip. Her clothes were comfortable if somewhat heavy, wool dyed green with thick leather pads on the knees and elbows. Bare black toes wiggled against the a traveling blanket. Her leather boots had tough rubber soles, which was why she didn't wear them inside the worm. She looked ready for a long journey into cold darkness. But where, where could a young woman be going and smiling about her prospects, too? There was one logical conclusion. Jopel caught the woman's gaze, nodded, and offered a friendly wink. Are you like me, miss, he inquired. Are you traveling to Port of Cross? She hesitated, glancing at the other passengers. Then she shook her head. I am not, no, she told him. Jopel thought he understood. But you're traveling through Krauss, he persisted. On your way to some other destination, perhaps? He was thinking about the New Isles. But she shook her head, a little embarrassed, perhaps, but also taking some pleasure from his confusion. No one else was speaking just then, and the intestine of a worm was a very quiet place. It was easy to eavesdrop and to be heard whenever you spoke. In quick succession, three young men offered possible destinations, picking little cities set on the auxiliary trails, each man plainly wishing that this woman's destination was his own. No, she told them, no, and I'm sorry, but no. The other passengers began to play the silly game, and to her credit, the woman remained cheerful and patient, responding immediately to each erroneous guest. Then the great worm began to shake around them, its muscular body twisting it as it pulled it off in, onto one of the side trails. Suddenly there was good reason to hurry the game along. The, two, the young men were leaving here. Didn't they deserve a useful hint or two? All right, she said reasonably. I'll remain on this trail until I am done. Then she closed her book with a heavy thump, grinning as she imagined her final destination. Left of left, someone shouted. We've already guessed that, another passenger complained. What else is there? Does anyone have a map? Joe Pale stood up. When their, when their worm was young and quite small, holes had been cut through its fleshy sides, avoiding the, the major muscle groups. Each hole was fitted with progressively larger rubber plugs and finally a small plastic window that looked as if it had been carved from a cold fog. Through one of those windows, Joe Pale could see the tall buildings of the city in their long shadows, plus the high, clear sky that was as close tonight as anything he had ever known. What a journey this had been, and it wasn't even finished yet. Not for the first time, Jopeo wished he had, a, he had kept a journal. Then when, he, when there was time, once he was living on the New Isles, perhaps, he would write a thorough account of every awful thing that had happened as well as his final triumphs. A dozen travelers were now examining their maps, calling out names of tiny places and abandoned cities. There was a time when people lived in the Tangle Lands and beyond, and points beyond, but that had been years ago. Only the oldest maps bothered to show one-time destinations. A young man, very tall and shockingly thin, was standing close to the woman, too close in Joe Pale's mind, and he carefully listed a string of places that existed nowhere but on a sheet of yellow paper and faded ink that he held up to the window's light. Yes, the woman said just once, but the tall man didn't notice. He kept reading off names, pushing his finger along the black worm trail, and the woman was saying no, no, no again, smiling pleasantly at his foolishness. But Joe Pale had noticed. Go back, he said. The tall, woman, the tall man looked at him, bothered by the interruption. Then a stocky old woman reached up high, hitting the fellow between the shoulder blades. The girl said yes, didn't you hear? Another woman said read backwards. The tall man was too flustered to do anything now. So Jopel took the map for himself, and in the dim light, he made his best guess. What about Good Mountain? Once more, the girl said yes. What kind of name is that, the tall man asked, reclaiming his map, taking the trouble to fold it up neatly. What does, the, what does that word mean, mountain? I've never heard it before. <coughs> but the game was finished. Suddenly, the old caretaker had returned, carrying an empty bucket with one bony hand. This is the station at World's End, Master Brace called out. The worm had come to a stop. My baby needs to breathe and eat her fill, he reminded everyone. So please, 
you must disembark with your luggage and with your tickets. Then a look of mischief, a mischievous look came into his weathered face and he added, but if you will, please leave your hopes behind. I'd like to claim a few of them for myself. A few passengers laughed at his bleak humor, but most just shook their heads and growled to themselves or they quietly spat on the smooth pink floor. The young woman was picking up her book and bags and her heavy boots, a joyous smile setting her apart from everyone else. About her destination, the enigmatic Good Mountain, she said nothing at all. Sip time. I read to my daughter sometimes, and man, you get dry. But I don't read these stories, <laughs> curiously. They don't hold her interest. A mouthful of history. Every homeland was once new, small and thin, pushed about by the willful winds. But the ground where Joe Pale grew up was still relatively young, and for much of his, its life it had been a free drifting body. Joe Pale felt an easy pride toward his native wood, dense and fine grained and very dark, fine grained and very dark, almost black in its deep reaches, with a thick cuticle and the pleasant odor of sin spice when sliced apart with steel saws. The wood's appearance and its telltale genetics made it offspring of gray tail and sweet sap lineages. According to the oldest nautical maps, an island matching that description first collided with the continent near what was today Port of Kraus. But it didn't linger for long. In those ancient times, the continent turned like a gigantic, if extraordinarily slow wheel, deep water roots helping to hold its green face under the eternal sunshine. This tiny unnamed body clung to the wheel's outer edge until it passed into the polar waters, and then it vanished from every record, probably drifting off into the cold gloom. Unable to grow, the island shrank. Hungry, it drank, its, drank dry its sap reservoirs. It could have brushed up against the continent again, perhaps several more times, but some current or chance storm always pushed it away again. Then it wandered, lost on the dark face of the world. The evidence remained today inside its body. Its oldest wood was full of scars and black, purple black knots, a catalog of rent, relentless abuse brought on by miserly times. Not even a flicker of sunlight fell on its bleached surface. Starving, the island digested its deep water roots and every vein of starch. Saprophytes thrived on its surface and giant worms gnawed their way through its depths. But each of those enemies was a blessing too. The tallest branches of the saprophytes caught the occasional breeze, helping the increasingly frail island drift across the quiet water. And the worms ate so much of the island that it floated easily, buoyed up by the air-filled caverns. Finally, the near corpse was pushed into the storm belt, and the storms blew it just so, carrying it out under, the, un, out under the motionless sun. There, the island turned a dark, vibrant green again, dropping new roots, roots that pulled minerals out of the nearly bottomless ocean roots that flexed and rippled to help hold the, sun, the island in the bright sunshine. And that's when new wood was built and rivers of sugary sap and a multitude of colonists began to find their way to its shores, including Joe Pale's distant ancestors. 1,200 years ago, the island again struck with the continent, collided with the continent, but this time it struck the eastern shore as far from, the, from Port of Kraus as possible. Its leeward edge pushed into the plain of perfect deeds while another free drifting island barged in behind, pinning it in place. Two more islands arrived over the next several years. Small bodies like these often splintered between shifting masses or they were tilted up on end, shattering when their wood couldn't, couldn't absorb the strain. Or sometimes they, they were shoved beneath the ancient continent, rotting to form black muck and anaerobic gases. But Jopel's homeland proved to be both durable and extremely fortunate. Its wood was twisted into a series of fantastic ridges and deep valleys, but it outlasted each of the islands that came after it, its body finding a permanent nook where it, would, where it could sit inside the world's great mother. By the time Joe Pale was born, his land was far from open water. The sun wobbled in the sky but never climbed too high overhead or dropped near any horizon. By then, more islands and two lesser continents had coalesced with the, with the continent. And the, and the once elegant wheel had become an ungainly oval. Most of the world's dayside face was covered with a single unbroken lid too cumbersome to be turned. Competing wood had pushed the weakest lands deep beneath the ocean, and like the keel of a great boat, those corpses held the continent in one stubborn alignment, only the strongest currents and the most persistent winds able to force the oval toward the east or the west. When Jopeo was a young boy, disaster struck. The trade winds strengthened abruptly, 
and in a single year the continent drifted west almost a thousand kilometers. Cities and entire homelands were plunged into darkness. Millions of free citizens saw their crops die and their homelands starve. The only rational response was to move away, living as immigrants on other lands or as refugees, or in a few cases, like Port of Cross, remaining where they were, in the darkness, making the very best of the tragedy. To a young boy, the disaster seemed like enormous good fun. There was excitement in the air, a delicious sense of danger walking on the world. Strange new children arrived with their peculiar families, living in tiny homes given to them by charities and charitable guilds. Joe Pale got to know a few of these people, at least well enough to hear their stories about endless night and the flickering of nameless stars, but he, but he still couldn't appreciate the fact that his own life was precarious now. Joe Pale was a bright child, but conventional, and he had a conventional family who promised him that the trade winds would soon weaken and the continent would push its way back to its natural location. What was dead now would live again, the, those trusted voices argued. The dark lands would grow again, and because he was young and naturally optimistic, Joe Pale convinced himself that he would live to enjoy that glorious rebirth. But the boy grew into a rather, a rather less optimistic young man, and the young man became a respectable and ordinary teacher of literature. During the average cycle, between one quiet sleep and the next, Joe Pale wouldn't once imagine that anything important about his world could ever change. He was in his house, sleeping unaware, when a moderate quake split the land beneath him. Early warning sensors recorded the event, and Joe Pale happened to read about the quake in the morning news book. But no expert mentioned any special danger. The continent was always shifting and cracking. Drowned islands would shatter, and bubbles of compressed gas were constantly pushing toward the surface. There was no compelling reason for worry, and so he ate his normal first meal and rode his two-wheel over the ridge to work, a small landowner's school set on softer, paler ground just beyond his homeland. And there he taught the classics to indifferent students, sat through a long department meeting, and then returned home again. Alone in his quiet house, he ate his last meal and read until drowsy, and then he slipped his, slipped his heat sleep hood over his head and curled up in bed. His house was small and relatively new, set in a corner of his parents' original farm. Joe Pale's property was part of a long, prosperous valley. But since he was no farmer, he rented most of the ground to neighbors who raised crops and kept forefoots, milking varieties that were made into stew meat and bone meal once they were, grew old. The neighbors also kept scramblers for their sweet meat, and they used teams of mockmen to work the land and its animals, lending every waking moment a busy, industrious quality. Joe Pale rose with the next cycle and went to work, as he did with the cycle after that and the cycles that followed. His homeland was blackish green beneath its transparent cuticle of hard wax. The rough walls of the valley were covered with parasites and epiphytes that sprang from crevices and wormholes. There were even a few wild animals, though not as many as when he was a boy. With each passing year, people were more common, the forests more carefully tended, and like every inhabited part of the world, his home was becoming domesticated, efficient and ordinary. For 20 cycles, Joe Pale went about his life without worry unaware that the first quake was followed by a series of little events, rumbles and slow, undetectable shifts that let gas and black seawater intrude into the gap between his one-time island and the buried coastline. Nobody knew the danger. There was nobody to blame afterwards. Indeed, only a few dozen people were killed in the incident, which meant that it was barely noticed beyond Joe Pale's horizon. He woke early that that last morning and slipped quietly from his house. A neighbor woman was still sleeping in his bed. She had arrived at his his doorstep at the, end of, uh, at the end of the last cycle, a little drunk and in the mood. Joe Pale enjoyed her companionship on occasion, but he felt no obligation to be with her when she woke. That's why he dressed in a hurry and rode off to school. Nobody knew that the seawater and his poisons had traveled so close to the surface, but in the time it takes a lover's heart to beat twice, the pressurized water found itself inside a sap well, nothing above but an open shaft and the sky. The resulting geyser was a, was a spectacle. Every survivor said so. Presumably the doomed were even more impressed watching the tower of salt water and foam soar high overhead, dislodged chunks of wood falling around them, and an endless thunder shaking the world as huge quantities of gas, methane laced with hydrogen sulfide, bubbled free. Suffocation was the standard death for people and everything else. The entire valley was killed within minutes. But the high ridges trapped the poisons, keeping the carnage contained. Even before Joe Pale heard the news, the disaster was finished. By the time he rode home again, 
Crews of mock men dressed in diving suits had capped the geyser. Engineers were busy drawing up plans for permanent repairs, and it was safe enough that a grieving survivor could walk to the ridge above, holding a perfume rag against his face as he stared down at the fate of the world. Water covered the valley floor, a stagnant gray lake already growing warm in the bright sunshine. The forested slopes had all either drowned or been bleached by the suffocating gases. From his vantage point, Joe Pale couldn't see his house, but the land beneath the, la the sea was still alive, still a vibrant blackish green. Pumps would have to be set up and osmotic filters, and then everything else would could be saved. But if the work happened too slowly, too much salt would seep through the cuticle, causing the land to sicken and die. Then the valley would become an enormous sore, attacked by fungi and giant worms. If nature was allowed its freedom, this tiny portion of the continent would rot through and the sea would come up again, spreading along ancient fault lines, untold volumes of gas bubbling up into the rapidly sickening air. People had to save the valley. Why shouldn't they? A rational part of Joe Pale knew that what was at stake, what almost every long-term prediction said was inevitable, but he couldn't shake his selfish need to enjoy the next cycle and the rest of his life. This ground had always been a part of him. Why wouldn't he want it saved? Let other people lose their little places. Let the continent die everywhere but here. That's what he told himself as he walked down the path, the perfume rag pressed against his nose and mouth, a self-possessed optimism flourishing for those next few steps. Where the gases hadn't reached, epiphytes still flourished. Each tree stood apart from its neighbors, like the hair on a head of an elderly mock man. That made for a tall open forest, which in turn allowed the land to receive its, its share of sunlight. A flock of day yabbers watched him from the high branches, leathery wings folded close, bright blue eyes alarmed by nothing except his presence. Giant forest roaches danced from crevice to crevice. Wild scramblers hid in nests of hair and woven branches, calling out at him with soft, mournful voices. Then the path bent and dropped, and everything changed. More yabbers lay dead beneath their perches, and countless silverfish and juvenile worms had crawled up out of their holes before dying. A golden, a giant golden gear tree had one of Jopel's favorite specimens was already turning black at its base. But the air was breathable again, the wind having blown away the highest poisons. Joe Pale wished he had his breathing mask, but he had left it inside his house, floating in a cupboard somewhere close to his dead lover. That woman had always been good company, but in death she had grown unreal, abstract and distant. Walking around the next, a next turn in the trail, Joe Pale found himself imagining her funeral and what delicate role he might play. And that was when he saw the wild scramblers that had fled the rising gas, but not fast enough. They belonged to one of the ground-dwelling species. He wasn't sure which. They had short, hairy bodies and long limbs and little hands that reached out for nothing. Crests of bright blue fur topped the otherwise naked faces. The gases had stolen away their oxygen and their lives. Already they were beginning to swell and turn black, lending them a strange, unfamiliar appearance. And when Joe Pale looked into their miserable little faces, he felt a sharp, unbearable fear. In death more than life, these scramblers resembled human beings. Here was the moment when everything changed for this scholarly gentleman, this creature of tradition and habit, of optimism and indifference. Gazing into those smoky green eyes and the wide mouths choked by their fat purple tongues, he saw his own future. That he didn't love the dead woman was important. If they were married and had children and if his family had died today, Joe Pale would have felt an unrelenting attachment to this corner of the world. In their honor, he would have ignored the urge to run away, remaining even as the land splintered and bled poisons and turned to dust and dead water. But escape was what he wanted. The urge was sudden and irresistible. And later, when he examined what was possible, Joe Pale discovered only one solution that gave him any confidence. If he sold his parents' land to his surviving, to his surviving neighbors and relatives, and if he bled his savings blue, then he could abandon the only home he had ever known and forsake the sun, as well as abandoning all those foolish little scramblers who couldn't see past their next little while. I think I'll stop there. <laughs>